good morning and welcome to uh, Physics 4C. Today is March 22nd. And today we're going to tackle chapter 28. Uh, chapter, I'm sorry, 28, I'm sorry, 18, <laughs> 10 chapters ahead. Anyway, uh, chapter 18 and then uh, chapter 19 is actually available on Canvas. I mean, it is on Canvas, but it is not available. Most likely I will make it available with all of its content and everything else, assignments and everything, starting from this Wednesday, because I intend not to spend a lot of time on chapter 18. Not because it's not important, but because the content, there are only a couple of ideas basically to explore. So we're going to move a little bit faster on this chapter. So there will be at least some problems also that we're going to do at the end. Anyway, so let me share. Uh, and we still have a lab this afternoon. So I'm hoping that to have as many people as possible for the lab so that you guys answer any of your questions and related to the lab activities. Today's lab is all about uh, the adiabatic process, the adiabatic process is next Monday's lab. It's about uh, now the, the whole thing escaped my mind, my mind right now. Let me remember. Let me see what the lab today is. Yeah, on thermal expansion. OK, this is an idea that we explored actually in chapter 17, that namely when uh, materials are subjected to a temperature, they tend to uh, to uh, change in length in general in volume actually this is what we will be exp uh, uh, exploring this afternoon in the lab session monday's lab next week is going to be on uh, the adiabatic process which i'm hoping to introduce on wednesday okay so uh, by wednesday we will have had enough uh, applications from this chapter chapter 18 and then we tackle the processes involved in thermodynamics there are main four main processes there is the uh, isothermal process, processes that involve temperature does not change, namely temperature is fixed. Iso stands for the same temperature, in this case thermal. And uh, I, uh, isochoric or isovolumetric is the same thing, meaning that the volume does not change. And then an isobaric, bar in here is the measurement of pressure, so that means the pressure does not change. And the last one is going to be explored, which is the subject of next lab, is the adiabatic process where a thing in an adiabat, the, uh, the, the gas does not uh, uh, receive or lose heat. So the gas maintain its heat, basically you wrap the whole thing in, uh, in a blanket and start working with it. So this is basically in a nutshell what uh, we need to do. So without further ado, I am going to first of all find my notes in here for this chapter and share with you the screen chapter 18. Okay. So chapter 18, as stated, deals with the, uh, with basically the PV equal to NRT. I wrote this expression in here, the Maxwell Boltzmann expression, because it's kind of lengthy. 99.9% of the time, I don't remember this term. I know that it has to do with the temperature, but the reason why you can find this this value easily, if you really want to, is by integrating. So all you need to remember is the V squared in here, which is very important. And this exponential of negative, uh, the kinetic energy, which is MV squared over two. And then you have Boltzmann constant KBT, okay? If you remember that, you should be able to recover this term. All you have to do, this is actually a probability distribution, meaning that uh, the particle will have a velocity anywhere between zero to infinity. So what you do in this case, you sum this value from zero to infinity and you will find uh, uh, one. You require it to be one because this is a probability distribution. And that is where that term comes in, in here. It is an example of something called normalization. So I know I am uh, toward the end talking about stuff toward the end of this chapter by this expression. But as I said, because I don't remember this term in here of it. So the reason why I'm writing it is I'm writing it this way. And then we'll come back to it okay, because I will need to uh, talk about this one. Before, before we do that, let's talk about the state of matter around the middle of the century in the 1800s, okay? Basically the 19th century. So we knew then experimentally that P V equal to an RT. I will try to do my best to stick to this convention that P, which stands for pressure, 
is written in lowercase p. Okay. I think we tried to do that too when we were doing flow dynamics. So let's stick with that convention in here that P, try to write it in lowercase as much as possible. So if you see it in uppercase, that is a an unintentional mistake, okay, at least in the representation, because there is another P that is actually in here. And we're going to talk shortly about it, and that is the momentum. So we need to make that distinction between the P and the P, okay? If you're taking physics for B, you will notice also there is a day, and I will tell you what they did, that is. You will be talking about the P and a P and a P, okay, three Ps. One of them is actually the uh, the pressure. One of them is actually the uh, momentum, and the other P actually is the power. So there is a day over the three Ps. Unfortunately, it's not pi. It's not 3.14. It's a day that comes in the future. That is for physics for B. For you guys, we have to deal with two P's today. We have the pressure P, which I'm going to write it lowercase p, and we're going to talk about the momentum shortly. And then this is the volume. N is the number of moles. Now let me write it down clearly in here. So this is the number of moles. So this is how many moles do you have? You have one mole, two mole, three mole, and basically at that point of the state of matter, we we're dealing with, okay, 22.4 liters is a mole for a gas, and then you start playing with that number, and then if you change the number of moles, apparently the number of whatever is inside changes, okay? So uh, the number of matter changes, the mass changes, okay? So there is stuff in that gas. So that is basically how we were looking at this. R is a constant, but we're gonna talk about it too. And then T is a temperature. And this temperature, and for your problems, guys, and you have to remember this very, very critical because it's gonna make a difference between getting an answer right and wrong. It has to be in Kelvin, not in any other system. So although the problem will give you the data probably in centigrade or Celsius, uh, you have to convert to Kelvins when you're using, using this expression. Case in point. Let's say, for example, the water is at zero degree Kelvin. What does that mean in terms of pressure? If this is zero, the whole side is zero. Either the pressure is zero or the volume is zero. That doesn't make sense because if uh, the pressure is zero, that means that there is no pressure whatsoever, that there is no effect whatsoever of the inside on anything of the, of the containers. Not only that, but the volume equal to zero is nonsense because it's, it's a, it's a, that means you don't have gas. So in this case, you know intuitively that T, uh, K, uh, T has to be in Kelvin, in which case the least amount of temperature theoretically possible is a zero Kelvin. And that is a theoretical limit only. It does not exist in practice. In practice, there is no such a thing of zero Kelvin. The lowest temperature is slightly above zero Kelvin. So you cannot have a zero Kelvin. So this is an important thing when you're doing calculations and trying to find energies and work and heat and things like that. Remember, when it comes to this expression, T is in Kelvin and not in any other unit system, Fahrenheit or anything else, doesn't matter, okay? R is a constant, no? R is equal to 8.314. The pressure is in Pascal or it's in Newton per meter. It's the same thing what the Pascal is. The volume is in cubic meter, okay? Cancel the meter and the meter and you're left with the meter squared. Remember, Pascal, I'm sorry, Newton per meter area, what am I talking about? I'm sorry. Pascal is pressure and pressure is a Newton per unit area. So it's a Newton per meter squared times cubic meter. So you'll be left with a meter in here instead of meter squared, what I was saying. So Newton times meter is a force times distance, which is in joules. So this number is actually in joules per unit mole, because in here, you need the number of moles in this expression, per Kelvin, because again, I was making a big fuss over the fact that this T has to be in Kelvin. So this is the unit and the number experimentally theory. This is what we have found, okay? In order to understand what's going on, Mr. Boltzmann made an, an, an assumption. He, he tried because all of this thing is works only for ideal gases, actually gases that require a certain 
this is why it's called the ideal gas law, okay? So this is an ideal gas law. It's an experiment. It's really based on observation, not because of any theory at that point. So we knew that if you double the volume, the pressure drops by a factor of half if the temperature is constant. If you double the pressure, the volume drops by a factor of half, in this case, if the temperature is constant. Now, if you double the temperature and you maintain the volume constant, the pressure will double. If you double the temperature and you maintain the pressure, the volume will double. So this is basically in a nutshell, there were three laws actually that were combined into this law and the constant in this case uh, uh, was 8.314 consistently if you use the SI system, okay? The thing with this is provided you bring one, you bring one mole. If you change the number of moles, then the whole situation changes. So that's why M came in into the expression. So this is all based on observation. In order to understand what's going on in here, this is what Mr. Boltzmann basically uh, uh, assumed, okay? Assume the following, that an ideal gas, so he thinks of a box in here, cube, if you wish, of length L. So all the sides in here of L, So this is L, height L, everything L. So the volume is clearly equal to L cubed from this simple geometry, okay? He said the following, this gas, namely the ideal gas, has the following assumptions. It's made up of tiny particles. He didn't know what they were, but he made an assumption and he wanted to understand PV equal to NRT. These dots are moving in every, which direction you can think of in the 3D, basically, they move in the X direction, which I'm going to assume this is the direction for the X direction. They move also in the Y direction and they move also in the Z direction, okay? So they move in 3D. These gases are, what they do in this case are rare enough not to collide with one another. So in between particle uh, collisions is negligible. So they are too small, actually, very small particles. That's what he called them, extremely small, not to collide with one another. Okay. The second assumption in here, so the only collision that is left is with the sides of this box. So with their container, so this is the container. So the only thing in here is that is going to be is the collisions with the, with the, with the container walls, okay? So the container wall in here, first of all, is rigid. In a sense, it doesn't move. It's immovable by this collision of these tiny particles, okay? So this is basically another assumption that what I'm saying in here is this particle are so tiny in size that they are actually, uh, they are not going, if one of them hits the wall, the wall is not going to budge from its location. So the only thing that is going to result from such a collision, if you guys remember from your physics for a class in this case is the change in momentum of that particle and that's the end of it, okay? So if the particle was coming this way, it's going to bounce back and go to the other direction because in this case also is assuming that these collisions with the walls are elastic collisions. Collisions with the walls are elastic collisions. So that's basically, if you make some of these assumptions, so there is a density assumption in here, because if you are, they are too dense in this case, then uh, there is a chance for them colliding with one another, albeit they are tiny, okay? So we're we going to assume the density is not high enough for me to do this. And sure enough, the ideal gas law actually works only for le less dense uh, gases. If the gas is dense, there is a divergence from this expression. So this is not true for all, uh, for all gases, basically. So ideal gases have a specific requirement. One of them is this one, okay? And the other thing in here is that he's making is that the, the container is rigid enough for these collisions not to move it. Okay, because they're too tiny, they have very small masses basically. So they are not going to impart a lot of energy to it so that the wall starts to move every which way, okay? And then the other thing in here is that this gas is iso isotropic, okay? 
the gas is isotropic, meaning that any direction I choose is this equivalent. So if whatever is happening in the X direction is the same thing happening in the Y direction is the same thing happening in the Z direction. The gas doesn't like or does not dislike one direction over the others. So it's all whatever, if I make a calculation for the X direction, it's the same thing that what is happening uh, in the Y direction and the Z direction. So in here, there is a symmetry, okay? Between all directions. It does not prefer one direction over the other, okay? So that is basically what the assumptions were. Obviously, he came up with a very beautiful theory. And then at the end, people were making fun of him because of the fact that, hey, Mr. Boltzmann, look at this, are your tiny particles in the air and things like that. And I think, I don't know, they said that this is one of the reasons why he committed suicide at the end. And at the time, atoms were not known. So that's why his assumption was kind of uh, outlandish, kind of a uh, little bit outside of the box. Uh, and people didn't believe it necessarily, including scientists, by the way, including people who are working in the field. It's not just like common uh, people. So uh, at the end, he came up with an explanation for what this PV equal to NRT means. So let's see here what that means. Let's take, for example, since all directions are the same, I'm going to take the X direction, OK? I'm going to ignore the other directions. So whatever we find for the X direction is going to be the same thing for the Y and the Z directions. So here is a wall. Obviously, this wall is in the YZ plane. So this direction is Y, and this way, this direction is Z. So a particle now comes in and collides with it, hit it, and go back, OK? So in this case, what I'm concerned with is the X component of the velocity, that's all. So the X component of the velocity hits the wall and bounces back. So when it bounces back, so it was moving with a velocity VX, so it has a momentum MVX. Now, when it bounces back, so this is a positive direction for the x-axis, if you're wondering. So when it bounces back, it has a minus vx momentum. So it hits the wall, bounces back, and goes, at least in the x direction, travels the whole distance L. Goes back, the whole distance L, hit the other wall, or whatever it does. We're just focused on this side now. This is the area A, OK? So it hits this wall which is L squared, by the way, the area. Because this is L, and this is also L. So all of them are L. So it hits the wall, travels to the other side, and comes back and hits the wall again. The wall doesn't move. So in this case, I'm not concerned about the momentum of the wall or anything like that. So in this case, basically, this collision will impart a momentum to the particle that is equal to the change in the, uh, I mean, impart an impulse, and that impulse is equal to basically uh, the final momentum, which is minus mvx, minus the initial momentum, which is mvx. So the impulse in this case is equal to minus 2 mvx. So this is the change in, in, in uh, if you wish, in the, uh, in the momentum of the particle. This is from the impulse, uh, uh, I don't remember which chapter, five or six from your guys' uh, textbook from chapter from physics 4a. But this is basically what happened in this case. So there is a change in momentum. So whatever momentum it had before, it goes back. Why? Because a collision is conservation of, uh, of uh, momentum, because delta p is constant. OK? Why? Because I'm assuming that it's an elastic collision. OK, now that is one thing. The other thing also is that by the impulse momentum theorem, this is equal to the force divided by the time between collisions. OK, so this is I'm sorry, force time is the time of a collision. So this is actually F times delta T. So this is your impulse momentum. Theorem. Do you guys remember this discussion about the impulse and momentum and the impulse being F times delta T and which is the change in momentum because this is delta P actually? Yes or no? From your physics for A? Yes, maybe.
you guys think? Do you remember this or not? It's fine if you don't remember, just from last semester or whenever he took for physics for A. Come on, guys, don't be quiet. I know it's Monday morning. Some of you probably did not have coffee already yet. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, that's that's fair enough. Okay. So if you guys don't remember that, I would re recommend that you go back into that part of the chapter where you were doing, where you're dealing with the co uh, collisions. Do you guys remember collisions at all? Okay. Okay, at least some of you do. Okay, here is the deal. Basically, when we have a system that is not under any external forces, then in this case, F external is equal to zero. And it's uh, in this case, if I write the, the forces that are involved must be internal forces only, okay? Because the internal forces, they cancel one another. So the external forces in this case, they, they, uh, they, are, they are equal to zero. When we work out that problem, we will find, in general, of course, M, M dV by dt is the force. That is for one particle. But if I have two particles, each and every one of them is subject to its own, basically, Ma equal to the sum of the forces. So in this case, M2 dV2 over dt is the forces that are on object number two. So let's assume that I only have two particles in this case. So if I work out my problem this way, what I'm going to say in here is that, and sum up the forces. So in this case, what I'm saying in here is the sum of the forces, all the forces, internal and external, is equal to, again, m1 dv1 over dt plus m2 dv2 over dt. Okay, It's natural in this case to define a quantity called mv. And the quantity mv is, by definition, is going to be uh, the momentum. So this is your momentum. So in this case, this expression can be clearly seen to be dp over dt is equal to the sum of the forces. Okay, so this is f equal to ma no more, except I'm writing it for a bunch of particles, one, two, three, a million or a thousand of them, it doesn't matter. So it's the sum of this momenta or how they change with time. Because I can take the derivative of my, from this expression easily, d over dt, of m1 v1 plus m2 v2, because I'm assuming I only have two particles. If I have three, I just add another one and so forth. That's why this quantity emerges in me naturally. So what I say in this case, the change in momentum with respect to time is the force. Now, the force are two kinds. The internal forces, namely the, the, the forces of interaction between the two particles, those are obey the third law of Newton. Each and every one of them cancel one another. So the only thing that is left in this sum is the external forces that are coming outside other than these mutual interactions, okay? So the mutual interactions, they cancel anyway because of the third law. So the only forces that remain are the, third, the, the external forces. Now, if the object, if the system is not under external forces, so what I'm saying in here, we are ignoring all external forces except internal forces. So in this case, the sum is zero anyway. So what we're saying in here, dp over dt is equal to zero. That means p does not change with time is constant. So this is basically, in a nutshell, what the uh, conservation of momentum is from physics for A. Okay, It's coming from this expression, provided that I have a bunch of particles. So m1 v1 plus m2 v2 and so on and so forth. So this is true for all collisions, elastic or inelastic. Momentum is conserved. So this is the conservation of momentum. Okay, a special case in here, in general, what I'm sorry, I was going to say, if I focus only on a particle by itself, so it's going to have its own dp1 over dt is going to be equal to, okay, let's let's define it a different, a different way, okay? In the situation where the external forces are not equal to zero, I can still say that this is the external forces 
This is the sum of all of the external forces, basically. This is the sum, not necessarily just one force, is equal to delta P over delta T, okay? This is in the, in, the, in the macroscopic limit. I'm not talking about the differential form. I'm talking as finite time. So in this case, what I'm going to say in general, this is true only when the external forces are zero. When the external forces are not equal to zero, so this is basically the expression that I'm going to have. The change in momentum is equal to the impulse. This is by definition what the impulse is, I, okay? This is the change in momentum in general. Okay, here is the story with this particle. It came in and here with its own momentum. Now it bounces back off of the wall, its momentum has changed. So a force must have been exerted by the wall in this case. And this is the momentum or the impulse that results from that collision. So this is the impulse, it's that force exerted by the wall on the particle. Does this make sense now? At least a little bit of a review of physics for A. Yes. Micah. So this is true only when the external forces are zero, but in general, you don't have to have, like in this case, in this scenario, as far as the particle is concerned, it hit a wall, which is an external thing out of it. So it must have been a subject to a force and then bounces back to it and hit again and again and again. And it's during that collision is the Delta T that is, that imparts uh, momentum to it. So for this case, it's actually not this scenario, but rather it's this one. So in general, we go back to this expression with some of the external forces, as far as the particle that hit the wall, this is what's going on with it. Does this make sense to you a little bit for those who don't remember this thing or did not have this thing in physics for a as much detail as they should? Micah? Okay, very good, very good. So it makes me feel better now. So here is the focus now. What I want to do now is I want to find this delta T, the time between collisions from the vantage points of this particle, at least for this part of the wall, the, the wall, this side, we don't care about the rest of it, okay? Obviously this particle can be traveling in every which way. So it's not necessarily going on the only X direction, but we're focused only on the X direction because of the last assumption that we're making that all directions are symmetrical. So once we find the story of what's going on in the X direction, we're going to make generalization for the other two directions. Okay, so what we're saying in here is this particle hits the wall, travels the entire length L and come back through the entire length L and hit it again. So it travels again, the entire length of the wall and come back again, the length of the wall and hit it again. So what I'm saying in here, the time between collisions is simply twice L because it's going to travel the wall, uh, the length of the wall L and then come back again L in the X direction to hit it again. So what I'm going to say in here as far as Delta T is concerned is, is the following. Delta T is simply equal to two L divided by its velocity in the X direction. So what I'm saying in here is it goes, hits the wall, travels L, come back L again with a speed VX. So if I have the distance, which is two L divided by VX, I know how often it's going to hit the wall. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. So this is the time between collisions. 've collisions not any kind of successive collision I mean in succession uh, uh, successive collisions to the wall I'm gonna go right in X direction I'm not concerned about any other wall I'm just gonna focus only on one of them make sense? Yes, no, because it's traveling with the velocity Vx, hit the wall, come back, but it needs to travel a whole length of the wall L and come back another L. So I want to know how long that it took it to basically do that. Since it's traveling with the velocity Vx, that's how much time it takes, yes? Okay, very good. So now let's go back into this expression, the, the momentum which is this part, 
I know Harris is far, came up a little late, but hopefully we'll catch up when he sees the video. Hopefully it makes sense to him too. And if it doesn't, please let me know. So this is the change in momentum. And this is the impulse. The impulse is fire, uh, force times time between collisions. So it's force times this time. Force times delta L over Vx is equal to the change in momentum in this case is minus 2 mvx. OK, so this is the force on a single particle now due to the wall, the collisions with the wall. So this force in here is going to be equal to minus 2mvx squared. Where does delta L come from? 2L, 2L. Where is delta L? Sorry about that. OK, divided by 2L. Obviously, the 2 and the 2 cancel. And I'm left with minus mvx squared over L with a minus sign, OK? So this is one particle, how much force is subject to when it hits the wall, traveling with a velocity vx, which is similar to all particles, basically traveling in all directions, OK? So this is how much one particle. But I don't have one particle in here. I'm going to assume that I have a big number of particles in here, because that's his assumption. There are too many of them to be counted. That's many uh, small there are many of them okay how many they are i'm going to call them n big n so before i do that i'm going to say this following statement this is the force on a force force on a particle i'm sorry force on a given on a single particle that makes up the gas OK? By third law, how much force the particle uh, hits the wall? OK? So here is what we have found. During these collisions, this particle, which I'm going to label particle, probably a specific particle in here, this particle is subject to this force coming from each collisions. Well, how much the wall will be subject to a force to by this particle? For that, we're going to use the third law of Newton. By third law, so this is the force, basically, the direction of it. So this is the direction of that force on that particle. How much force is going to be on the wall? By that particle. So the particle comes in and hits the wall, OK, and bounce back. Now, the wall will exert this force on it. This is what we have found. Now, I want to know the force on the wall now. How much do you think it's going to be? And the third law of Newton in here is at play. How much is that? Are they different or they're the same or what? Come on, guys. Take a guess. If I hit the wall by 10 Newton, how much the wall will hit me back? This is physics for A stuff. Come on, guys, I need people to participate in classes. I really don't like it when I'm talking by myself.
Come on, guys. You guys understand the question or not? Yes or no? So if I hit the wall with 10 Newtons, how much the wall will hit me back? Come on, guys. Yeah, that is, that's what I was looking for. Is there a delay in Canvas or what? Because it seems like the answers are coming very, very much delayed. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's all I'm saying in here is it's the same force, okay? By third law, e uh, 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 action reaction principle. So if the wall, is basically imparting this force to the particle, mainly hitting it back with this force that we just computed. This is the force on a particle because we found its impulse. And once we found its impulse, we divided by the time and we found the force on it. Now, obviously the force that is exerted by this, this particle, okay, on the wall is going to be the same magnitude except it's going to be positive and that's the end of it. It's going to be pointing in the X direction equal and opposite in magnitude. So the force imparted on the wall in this case simply is going to have the plus sign and everything else will be the same. So this is the force on the wall. It's going to be a positive number of mass times velocity squared divided by the length, okay? I don't have one particle, I have n particles. So on average, what I'm going to say in this case for average of n particles on average, n particles will exert a force which is going to have the, the bar on top of it is simply equal to mvx squared on average times n divided by L. So this is the average force, okay? So what I'm saying in here is this is a particle, one particle, one specific particle. So I'm going to label its, its value by VI and square that its velocity, okay, in the X direction, multiply by its mass and divide by the length. This is one particle. And sum up now through all of these quantities, that is what I'm saying in here, from I equals to one all the way to N particles. So, but if I divide that by the, because uh, each one of them has a mass MI, okay? If I divide by that, by the sum of the masses in this case, MIs, what am I, what am I doing in here, semi? In this case, it's going to have the mass in here. I need to define the average correctly in this case, okay? So divide by their sum, okay, from one to N, okay? So this is clearly the same mass, so it's going to come out of the sum in this case, okay? Even if I do MI, sum of Ms, so if, even if I put the Ms in here, it's going to come out of the integral. So at the end, is going to have an, a sum, I'm sorry, so the sum of the Is. So I'm going to have in here n divided by n. So it's going to have divided by n. Each and every one is contributing this much force, okay? And that is no more than just the average quantity, but the average quantity of the square, okay? You have to remember that, not the average quantity of the velocity squared. It's the average of the square velocities, which is different, okay? So this is the average of the velocity squared. The bottom line is just average this quantity because some of them are moving faster than others. When I took a specific particle in here, I made the assumption that that particle has a velocity Vx in the x direction. But now if I include another particle, it may be moving faster or slower. That's why I really have to be concerned with this as being an average quantity no more, okay? But each and every one of them has, comes in with contribution to that average. And that's basically in a nutshell what this quantity is. All I have to do now is divide by the, the area of the, uh, because I have a bunch of them now hitting the wall on average. So what I want to is the pressure in this case. And the pressure is just the overall force, F total, divided by the area. So all I have to do is just divide, divide this force by 
the area and now I'm in business. So, so the pressure is going to be this force on the wall. If I put a gauge there, if I put a measure to measure how much pressure, it's that value divided by A. So it's going to be N times M times Vx squared over L squared. And I already have an L and this quantity is the volume. So what I'm finding in here is that P times V, the pressure times the volume is equal to N times M times Vx squared. And this is basically what we have found. All I have to do is divide this by two and multiply it by two. So we have a problem now with these two things in here. Yeah. And we have found the expression in here. This is the components of the kinetic energy in the x direction, if you wish, the contribution to the kinetic energy in the x. Uh, there is an average in here I have to include, okay? So the average kinetic energy in the x direction. Now, let's remember that the kinetic energy of a single particle, and this is a single particle, is equal to one half of m times v squared, where v is actually its total velocity, which is one half of the m v x squared plus v y squared plus v z squared. So this is actually the actual velocity of a single particle. Now, what I'm saying in here is that the x direction and the y direction and the z direction are equivalent because of this isotropic argument that we have made already. So in this case, this quantity is just the three times of either because Vx squared on average and Vy squared on average and Vz squared on average are the same by symmetry. There is no direction better than the other directions. So if I focus on Vx squared, it's three, uh, and I add uh, something that is equal to it and add something that is equal to it. So I'm going to find that the V squared, the actual V squared on average, I'm sorry, V squared on average, which is just the sum of either uh, all three of these quantities is just three, either one, pick and choose whichever you like. So I'm gonna use Vx squared because the whole argument was about the x direction because they are all equal on average. So in this case, the Vx squared is just a third. So the Vx squared on average is equal to one third of the entire velocity squared, the average of the velocity squared. So in other words, PV pressure times volume is equal to two thirds of N times m times the square of the velocity, the whole velocity squared divided by two. This is the kinetic energy now, the total kinetic energy of a particle, out of a given particle. Obviously, the experiment didn't say that. The experiment says that PV is equal to nRT. If I make the following assumption in here, if I know the molar mass, how much mass per mole, the molar mass, which is equal to big M. In this case, it's clear that big N, I'm going to assume that for one mole, for one mole, big, uh, big M is equal to just a given number times the mass of the particle, which is what we call Avogadro's number. If I don't have one mole, but I have n mole, so it's again, it's going to be just for any number of moles, then the mass in this case, or the actual mass, the net mass that it's labeled sometimes, m net, or the total mass, is going to be just the number of the particles times m, okay? Where m is the mass of a given particle. So it's clear from here that the mass of the particle is equal to the big molar mass divided by Avogadro's number. So if you look at the periodic table and look at a specific gas or even an element, it doesn't matter which, 
and you take a mole of that, you have an Avogadro's number times that number, which is in grams, okay? So a mass of a specific element is that the entire mass in gra grams or kilograms, if you want to convert it to kilograms by multiplying, dividing by 1,000, divided by Avogadro's number. That is how mass that we're talking about. Very, very tiny mass. Of course, they are small, okay? So this is basically how we're saying in this expression. Now, enabled with this expression, we're going to uh, write this expression as in another format in here. We're going to pull n in here. This is going to be equal to n times k times bt. So what Boltzmann has made in here is that if I pull n out, this entire expression is nothing but the contribution to the kinetic energy coming from different elements of the gas in this case, okay? So it looks like KBT, if I cancel that, KBT, the book uses the letter K for uh, the Boltzmann constant. This is, I use KB in this case because a lot of literature use KB. Boltzmann constant. So this is just one third because I just canceled that to a half. So I know it's related to the kinetic energy. One third of uh, RT. I, I'm sorry, Avogadro's number. I have to include in here Avogadro's number times RT, okay? Which is, in this case, it's clear then that R and Avogadro's number and KB are related to one another. As a matter of fact, KB, which is just that number that I stated in the beginning, 8.314 divided by Avogadro's number. So KB is just another constant, uh, which is equal to, uh, uh, what is it again? I forgot the, uh, so uh, KB is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23. Obviously I didn't include the, uh, including here the Avogadro's number, which is six times 10 to the power 23. So basically do the math and you will find the two, how they are, they are related. So now we have actually uh, found to an explanation now for this, this, this kinetic energy. So one half of mv squared then, according to this expression, if I cancel the n and the n is equal to, so the average kinetic energy per particle, one half of mv squared now, so this is the average kinetic energy per particle is equal to clearly three halves of RT. Three halves of KBT, I'm sorry. Three halves of K, because the N and the N cancel, and I will be have KBT times three halves is equal to just this quantity in here, okay? So this is equal to three halves of KBT. Here is the story now. The particle is moving in the X direction or the Y direction and the Z or the Z direction. Each direction will contribute basically one half of KBT because the particle has an X component and a Y component and a Z component. So what we're saying in here is that each component per this expression that we have found, contribute one half of KBT for this relationship to work, of course. Because this is the experiment. This is what the observation was saying. Okay. Now, if I redefine my n now as being just the number n divided by na. So if I can write now n, the number of moles again, as just the total number of particles divided by Avogadro's number, so that this expression works, so that they have really a temperature times something, times n. That's what I ended up with in this case, in this analysis. I need to introduce a new constant KB in such a way that KB was just simply the ratio of R over this Avogadro's number. Okay. If I do that, I have a match, first of all, with the observations, number one. Number two, I have an explanation for the kinetic energy of a particle. The kinetic energy on average is actually the temperature. That's all we're saying in here. So when you measure, when thermometer measure, when thermometer measure 20 degrees Celsius, it's measuring how fast the particle is moving in that, in that uh, temperature. If you measure the temperature to be 100 degrees Celsius, they are moving super fast and you can use this expression to find it, okay? So this is a temperature 300 Kelvin, which is room temperature 20 degrees Celsius, 23 degrees Celsius or 27 degrees Celsius. 
when you add uh, 373 Kelvin, this expression now gives you faster moving particles. So this is what it is. So the temperature, in this case, according to this expression, temperature measures the average kinetic energy of the particles. Doesn't matter which direction they are, you're squaring the number, the velocity, and averaging. So it's going to be a positive number. That's why the temperature can never be negative because of this, uh, this requirement. It can never be zero, actually, Kelvin temperature, because they are always in thermal agitations, even at the T, t theoretical limit when it's zero Kelvin. At that point, quantum mechanics takes over and cannot make this one equal to zero. So it's always agitation. There is something that you probably would learn in physics 4D, which is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Particles cannot stop because if they stop, then that violates that principle and you cannot do that. So in quantum mechanics provide, I mean, uh, 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 prohibits temperature to be zero. It cannot be zero Kelvin. It can be slightly more, that's fine, but anything but zero. So that is basically a requirement for this expression. So in this case, this is what the temperature really measures. So your thermo thermometer is measuring how fast the particles are moving on average, okay? Now, since we looked at this expression in here, this is another way of rewriting the same expression time and again. So either with the kinetic energy, which is, has to do with the temperature. Another thing that emerged, and it's extremely important for your calculations, is this expression. Where is it? It's this one, the last one in here, actually. The fact that the kinetic energy, since it has three degrees of freedom, it can move in freely in the x direction, or three, uh, y direction, and z direction. That's why you have that three there. Okay. If you take a molecule, for example, diatomic molecules, it can move in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. It can actually spin around one x or the other. So for a diatomic uh, molecule, the average kinetic energy, there will be another rotation because of the fact that in a diatomic uh, molecule, like for example, if you take H2, which is made up of two hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms. So in this case, yes, it can move in the X direction. Yes, it can move in the Y direction or the Z direction, I'm sorry. Yes, it can move in the Y direction. The whole molecule basically changes locations or it can spin around an axis in this case, uh, which is uh, parallel to the Y axis. So it's gonna spin in the parallel to the Y axis or actually can spin in an axis parallel to the Z axis, but there is no spinning of matter in the Z direction, in the X direction because it's tiny still. So the assumption that they are still tiny, it still works. So in this case, you only have two more degrees of freedom that come in because of the, uh, of the rotation. So in this case, if I go back to this expression, to this assumption that they are small. So in this case, for the hydrogen atom, for the hydrogen gas, I'm sorry, or the oxygen gas for that matter, or nitrogen gas, all of them, they are dioxidic, they are, they are diatomic gas, gases. In this case, they, 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 they have two more additional freedoms. So this expression, when you average it to find that it's going to have a five over two in it instead of three over two, because each degree of freedom can, brings one half of KBT. This is important. It's called the equipartition theorem, which we're going to state it in here. And this is part of the discussion that you're going to equipartition theorem. Each degree of freedom brings one half of KBT contribution. the energy and let me say why this is important okay it's very very important okay this is basically i want you to really think about this item okay and uh, think about it because it's critical for a lot of the analysis that comes in let me go back because this has a component in the x direction the y direction the z direction this is a single particle basically assumption that uh, that's what we came up with because that's what the analysis is. Had we included the rotation, like for example, in a diatomic gas, this will not be three halves. This would be five halves, okay? Because again, we're conserving the kinetic energy because this collision is elastic collision, actually. That's the whole assumption with it. Now, 
the rotation will bring two more degrees of freedom because the diatomic uh, uh, gas, although the particles are so tiny, so they can spin around this axis, but they can spin around this axis or around this axis. So there are two degrees of freedom in addition to the displacement in the x direction or the y direction or the z direction. Okay. So those are five ways for it to, to change its kinetic energy, hence contributing to the temperature in here. Okay. There is another gas type of gases that actually has more than that. Three di diatomic gases, like carbon dioxide, for example, in this case, you have three ways for it to move, okay? Because it can move in and out, up and down, or left and right, and furthermore, it can actually spin in one of a lot of axes. No, no, more than that, it's actually the vibrations need to be included. I'm neglecting in here the vibrations because most of the times the temperatures are not high enough to include the vibrations. But if the temperature starts to increase, then vibrations will come into play. And that is beyond classical mechanics, it's quantum mechanics. So I'm going to introduce a concept in here called the, uh, the, uh, the specific heat, the molar specific heat. Okay, at constant volume. Okay, because these particles, I'm assuming that they are free to me to move. There is, they don't really have potential energy. The only energy that they have is the kinetic energy. So the total energy of a gas is the total. The total. The U in this case is the energy of the gas, okay? Is the total uh, kinetic energy, end of the story. I don't know how much it is, but uh, we usually don't care about it. We care only about the change, how much change, okay? So here is the deal. If I take a gas now and fix it, so the, the wall containers don't move like I was describing to begin with. In this case, and increase its temperature, for example, with a, putting it under a furnace in this case. Obviously, the particles start to move faster and faster as they are inside. So the temperature will increase. T initial was T1 and increase to T2, okay? Because I'm heating it. If I do the other way around, put it uh, uh, on top of a, uh, top of it, let's say, for example, ice, its temperature will decrease. So in this case, the, the, the change in the kinetic and the change in the total energy will be reflected by this slowing down or speeding up of the particles. Either the kinetic energy increases or decreases. So what I'm saying in this case is that the change in the kinetic energy is going to be equal to the specific heat in this case at constant temperature times the change in temperature. This is for one mole. For n moles, I have this many. That's all. So in this case, the specific heat CV is just how much the gas is. Is this molar specific heat? Okay. The reason why I'm saying that is because when the gas is not allowed to change its volume, so it's not doing work against the, the environment, it's not pushing against the environment, and the environment is not going to push against it. So this is actually the amount of heat, end of the story. Okay, So heat, in this case, at constant volume, this is the assumption at constant volume, so it's only heat that I'm going to do. So this is how much heat I'm going to add to the system or extract from it. So it's going to be NCV times delta T. How much temperature went up in the case of heating or how much temperature went down in the case of cooling, in the case of temperature going up, so its energy is increased. In the case of its temperature going down, its energy is actually increased, decreased. And this is how much change in the kinetic energy in that case. And it's given by NCV delta T. So if I again look at the the ideal gas now, a monoatomic gas, monoatomic gas, monoatomic gas. It's clear then that each degree of freedom will bring one half of KBT, and there are only three degrees of freedom in this case, can move in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. So for a monoatomic gas, the change now is equal to simply delta U is going to be simply equal to three halves of R times delta T, okay? Because each and every one of them 
will bring number of Avogadro times this number times the number of uh, particles or the number of moles times R times delta t times the change in temperature, okay? So in this case, that is basically the answer to that. So in this case, for a monoatomic gas, CV is equal to three halves of R. This is a very, very important result that's going to really help you solve a lot of your problems, provided you're dealing with a monoatomic gas, okay? And they tell you it's a monoatomic gas, or they tell you that the gas has this. So the only thing that matters is the change in temperature to see the change in energy, end of the story, okay? Now, for a diatomic gas, what I mean by monoatomic gas is, for example, the helium. This is a monoatomic gas or argon. All the noble gases are actually monoatomic gases, okay? What I mean by diatomic gas is, again, I mentioned it already, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, or even carbon monoxide. Uh, they have to be a little bit symmetrical, but that's fine. Carbon monoxide also is actually monoatomic, uh, diatomic gas, okay? So these are uh, good examples of, a, of this problem. For a diatomic gas, again, the change in the energy in this case is going to be N times, instead of, I'm sorry, this is for one mole, okay? This is for one mole, okay? In general, you have to multiply by N, okay? Again, we're just looking for a specific mole. It doesn't matter. CV is going to be three halves of R because C, uh, 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 CV is defined for one mole, okay? So CV is correct, always three halves of an R for a monoatomic gas. As a matter of fact, in here too, it's going to be, now I, I added the two degrees of freedom due to a rotation for a diatomic gas. So it's gonna be three halves times the change in delta T. And again, in this case, the CV is always going to be five halves of RT. Five halves of R, I'm sorry, okay? This is a very important result that you actually need also for your calculation. These are the keywords to watch in for the problems when you're solving problems in thermodynamics. Is it a monoatomic gas? Is it a diatomic gas? Or is it a polyatomic gas, okay? For a polyatomic gas, polyatomic gas, in this case, more and more degrees of freedom are, 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 are involved. Approximately, not true all the time, C CV is equal to seven halves of RT, seven half of R, okay? So this is not true, okay, all the time. It depends really on the temperature and this value changes. As a matter of fact, if you do an experiment, the value jumps from three halves to five halves, and then it starts to involve more and more values after that, okay? So it goes three halves, then it jumps to five halves. This is as, usually as a function of temperature, and the structure also, okay, from type, okay? And then to another one, and then involves different, this is quantum mechanics now comes into play because the energy is quantized and different stuff involved. So for most of our problems, these are the two values to remember. Unless given otherwise, they will tell you CV is equal to a specific number. So in that case, just use that number, okay? So for right now, just basically uh, ignore this last case because it's gonna be given to you. Okay, just focus on the first two, namely the fact that CV equal to three halves of an R or five halves of an R, okay? So those are the two because one of them has moves only the X, Y, Z direction and the other one can spin in addition to that in two other axes, okay? That's basically how you arrive to this expression. Which brings me to a very important point in here. In all of our analysis, we were doing just with the average kinetic energy, average values. An average of the square is actually to be more specific. So Mr. Boltzmann, when he came up with his theory, he was concerned. Some of these particles are moving faster than others, okay? Some of these particles were moving faster than others, so he wanted to argue how can we make an assessment for it. So he had to use invent, actually he has to use a little bit of the existing mathematics at that time, statistical mechanics, statistical mathematics, and then uh, uh, converted to mechanics and became known as statistical mechanics. So, and this is where these expressions are needed now, the ones that I actually had to write to begin with, because I don't remember them. So this factor in here, which is four pi times 
times this four pi has to do with just the, the, the angle in this case. It's this pi factor m over two pi kbt that is coming from the actual normalization. So let me write it m over two pi kbt in here. To the factor three half times four pi v squared. 4 pi v squared is again just the 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 uh, 4 pi the solid angle actually for a sphere when you add up all of the uh, radii so if we assume symmetry again this is just the area of a sphere except it's in the v space not in the x space not in the real space times the exponential of minus the kinetic energy in this case mv squared over 2 and kbt the contribution of every single degree of freedom in here so this is how the particles are have their velocity with respect to a specific value in this case on average okay so let's look at this distribution and plug it okay obviously this is a gaussian distribution if you're con concerned about that so this is the boltzmann maxwell distribution actually called because mr boltzmann when he came up with this expression he really didn't have it in this form it was maxwell who really changed it a little to this form So what are we talking this three distribution? So what are we talking about in here? Here is the deal. Particles on average, depending on the temperature T, because as you can clearly see T here is involved big time in this expression, will have a distribution. Some of them are moving very slow speeds. Okay, Some of them, they're very little, hardly if anybody is stationary. Some of them are moving with very little speed. Some of them are actually moving super high speeds. Okay, But on average, this is how they behave. So this is how this distribution is. So if you're concerned trying to find how many particles are moving in a gap between V and V, and v plus dV, so this is how you do that. So this is the number of particles that are moving in a gap between V and, uh, and, v, and v plus dV. So this is their number, okay? So in other words, there is a peak in here peak value. The peak value is very easy to find. All you have to do is take just the derivative of this expression with respect to V and equate it to zero. And you will find that this value is actually equal to the peak velocity is equal to the square root of two, uh, what is it? M over KBT, okay? So this is the peak velocity. In other words, it drops, it should increase, I'm sorry, it's backwards, 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 KBT over M. It should increase with temperature, what I'm talking about in here. It should increase with temperature. I'm sorry, I made a mistake in here. Obviously, the faster the particles are moving, the higher the temperature and vice versa. So this is important. Hydrogen, which is lighter than oxygen, if it exists at the same temperature, hydrogen will be moving faster because it has less mass than oxygen. That's what happened to planet Venus, actually. During at some point, all of its oceans evaporated. And when they evaporated, actually, the temperature became so high during those collisions that the water that existed on the surface of Venus basically broke down into oxygen and hydrogen. But uh, hydrogen over time evaporated from the entire planet and left it. And uh, oxygen is basically still there in the, its atmosphere. Okay, So that's basically what happened. It lost all of its water. There is no, no way to recombine that planet back into its water. Earth also is undergoing through that. So if I take different masses, the bigger the mass, the lower the peak velocity is. So in this case, the oxygen is escaping the Earth, but not as much as the hydrogen. Hydrogen is escaping much faster than that. But the Earth is doing an outgassing. Basically, it always releases more uh, 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 water in the atmosphere or more, basically, gases in the atmosphere to compensate for it. The problem is, is so is Venus, actually. The problem with that one, if you compare that one to Mars, for example, it does not have a lot of outgassing, so it's losing all of its atmosphere, and it's been doing that ever since. Okay, so. There is no geological activity on uh, Mars to compensate for the losses. Okay, so all of the gases are escaping, actually, including carbon dioxide too, to some extent. So the ones that are moving super fast in here, they will escape. 
they will have velocity higher than the escape velocity of the planets. The ones on average in here, they're moving slow enough. For example, uh, if we do the calculations, most of the gases in here, they will be retained by the Earth, okay? So this is the peak velocity. Now we want to find the mean velocity. The mean velocity or the average velocity will be just a square root of 8 kBT over M. But that's really not of an interest, honestly, it's slightly more than the peak velocity. The, the important one is the RMS, the average of the squares. This is called, under the square root, of course, this is called the root mean square. You square the quantity, you find its mean, and then you take the square root. This is of great importance in all of our calculations because that is the one involved with the energy. So it's 3 kBT over M. So this is where you're going to compare, for example, hydrogen to oxygen and all of these things. It's the RMS value. A lot of the problems in the homework deal with the RMS value. So the, this is basically how much you find in here. Square root. The calculation for this one, both of these quantities involve, involve Gaussian, okay? So in order to find the average, you have to integrate. You have to sum through this quantity from zero to infinity. So you'll have a V squared then in here an X squared. So it's going, going to involve the Gaussian integration. And then in order to find this one also, you're going to multiply by another V squared. So in order to find this V, you have to multiply by V and you're gonna end up with V cubed. And you can do the integration by parts until you get to the Gaussian, which you're gonna sub its value or do the integration for it, which is not hard. Lengthy calculation, but it's not hard. V squared in here again. So we're going to multiply by another V squared. So this is going to be V to the power four and you do the summations. And this is the quantities that we're going to end up with. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, this factor is so-called normalization. In other words, a particle must exist there with a certain velocity. So any particle in here must have a certain velocity. So the entire area from beginning to end is one. And this is the quantity that ensures that this area, this quantity is one, okay? So that is basically what this number is, and I never remember it, honestly. I remember the solid angle times the velocity to square times the exponential. So if you ever ask to do this, which is not part of this class at all, you're going to require this number in here. Otherwise, you can prove it just by doing the calculation in here, okay? <clears throat> anyway, so this is in a nutshell for the entire lecture for this class. I still, I think, have about 15 minutes to do at least one problem, yes? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Problems, not per. I don't know what I wrote there. Okay, very good. So, let me get the book. The problems that I'm thinking to do from this book are problem 78. And then. Uh, 68 and then 67, okay? Since uh, problem 68 is a very interesting problem and I'm going to defer that to Wednesday. Problem 60, uh, 78 also I'm going to defer that to Wednesday. So I'm gonna do problem 67, which is kind of a, a fun problem that you guys are going to encounter sometime in your lives, okay? especially if you're going to do solid state physics, material science, or going to do chemistry. So or chemical engineering or any engineering has to do with that. So it's, it's so-called, uh, uh, what is it? The Leonard Jones potential, okay? So it's, it's, you're gonna see it in one form or the other, okay? So problem 67, and I actually tested on it on the past. So that you, so, so that you guys, you know, so it's given by U naught times uh, R naught over R squared minus two times uh, R naught over R to the power six. So basically you have two terms in here, okay, for a, mo uh, to, for a molecule. So a commonly used potential energy function for the interaction of two molecules so you have one molecule and another molecule there doing interactions. So this is the potential between them, okay? 
So the roots for this one is to just model some some basically interactions which usually involve a uh, uh, my, uh, uh, spectroscopic basically uh, studies of materials, uh, material sciences and things like that. So this is a model for it. <clears throat> where R is the distance between the centers of the molecules in U0 and R0 are positive. The corresponding force F of R is given by uh, an equation 14.26. What is 14.26? I don't even know. Chapter 14. Yeah, if you look at the problem for the chapter 14, actually, on at least on the 15th editions, vibration of the molecules, and that is page, start from page 443 in the 15th edition, okay? So basically, it gives you the same uh, electric potential. It's going to give you the force. Anyway, the force you know derives from a potential in this case, F is equal to minus du over dr. So it's going to be clearly equal to minus u naught time is the derivative of this number with respect to r. When you take the derivative of one over r to the power 12, I'm sorry, why do I put one in here, okay? Uh, I forgot to put one in there. So the, you're going to derive the denominator, so we're gonna br bring, the denominator is r to the, r to the negative 12. So we're gonna bring a negative 12 in here, in this case, r naught to the power 12 divided by the new power, which is r to the power 13, okay? And then minus, again, six times two with a positive sign again, because you have a minus times minus, in this case, it's gonna be a positive. Two times six times, uh, again, R naught to the power six divided by the new power, which is R to the power seven. This whole thing is the force, okay? Six times two and 12 come out of the integral. And if you like to pull it with the R to the power seven, it's fine. So we're going to have an R to the not to the power six divided by an R to the what am uh, R to the power seven or so we're going to have positive twelve U naught times <clears throat> R naught to the power six divided by R to the power seven. Okay, so what are we left with in here? First of all, in here we are left with one because we have twelve, we have R naught, we have R to the power seven, so we're left with one. Oh, I'm sorry, with a negative one, what am I talking about? Because we took the positive sign too. So it's a negative one. We took a negative in here too, okay? So in here, we're left with a positive. So 12 is out, R naught to the power 12. So I'm left with an R naught to the power six divided by R to the 13 minus seven is also six. And this is the force basically, how much the force is, okay? So if, you're, if you don't want to look at that uh, page, this is basically what the force should look like. Just the derivative minus the gradient of the force, which you guys did also in physics 4A, okay? Now, graph the function use of R and F of R versus R. If you do that, this is R. This is the potential for sub R. Let's try draw the potential U over U naught. It's much easier. And instead of drawing R, I'm going to draw R over R naught. So in this case, the potential u over u naught, the function I'm plotting, is going to be equal to r naught over r, which is one over x to the power. So this is one my y. So this is going to be one over x to the power 13, I mean 12, minus 2, divided by x to the power 6, where x I'm defining it as just r over r naught. Okay. All you have to do now is just look at this expression in here in this, in this fashion. So this is my new variable, r over r naught is x, and y is just u naught, u over u naught, okay? <clears throat> For x going to infinity, when x is super large, this goes to zero, and so is this one. Both of them are going to zero, okay? But it's a negative infinity, so it's on this side in here. Okay, when x, goes to zero. This goes to infinity and this quantity also goes to infinity, but this goes faster to infinity. So it's a positive on this side. So it must have crossed the uh, x-axis, reached a certain minimum, and basically go to infinity. So that is this function. 
Now, if I want to draw the force now, the force, I'm going to the same fashion in here, F over. So my Y now is going to be F over this quantity, which is 12 times U naught times R naught. I'm sorry. Uh, divided by R, uh, R naught to the power one. So if I have to multiply by R naught, divide by R naught. So it's going to be multiplied by R naught, not divide by R naught. So in other words, multiply, multiply this entire expression by R naught and divide by it, okay? So what I'm left with in here is R naught to the power seven over R, which is going to be my same axis in here in this case. So it's gonna be one over X to the power seven times one over X to the power six minus one. Or if you wish, it's going to be, I'm sorry, X to the power six. So it's gonna be a one over X to the power 13 minus one over X to the power seven. Okay, again, in the same fashion, this force also is going to go to zero below, and in the positive one, it's going to be that value. So it's going to behave more or less in a similar fashion, okay? Okay, so this is the fire function. If you don't trust me, just plug this to a calculator and plug them and draw them. Make sure it starts from zero to infinity. Now, this is how the functions would look like. Again, just look at the graphs in here, and they look more or less identical on page 444 on the book, okay? Now, excuse me, guys, one second, okay? I have somebody on. Okay, again, I'm sorry about the interruption. So how are we doing? Say about three minutes. Let's see if we can do something in here. Now, let R1 be the value of R at which U sub R is equal to zero. So we're going to solve this equation and make it equal to zero. So U sub R, we're going to make it equal to zero. For that, this quantity has to be equal to zero. That means one over X to the power 12 minus one over X to the power minus two over x to the power six, I'm sorry, is equal to zero. This expression has to be equal to zero. So if I multiply everywhere by x to the power 12, so I'm gonna be left with x to the power six minus two, I'm sorry, x to the power 12, not x to the power six. So there's gonna be x, it's gonna be one minus x, two times x to the power six is equal to zero. Okay, provided x is not equal to zero, so I can do that multiplication. So this will become one, and this will become just that number. So x is clearly equals to one over two, uh, the root, the sixth root, okay? Not the square root or the cubic root or something like that. That will make this value equal to zero. In other words, this is actually r one over r naught. That's how they defined it, okay? So r one is simply equal to R naught over the sixth root of two. So this is the value that is of concern in here. This is this value. This is R one that makes this potential equal to zero. So by making this quantity equal to zero. So that is R one and it's just R naught over that cubic sixth root of two, okay? And then it says in here, let R two be the value of R at which the force is equal to zero. Well, the force is equal to zero when this derivative is actually equal to zero, and it's clear that one over x to the power 13 minus one over x to the power seven is equal to zero. If I multiply by x to the power 13 everywhere, this is going to be one minus x to the power six is equal to zero. That means x is equal to one. That means x uh, r is equal to r naught, okay? And that is this point. That makes this value zero, which is just the minimum function for this one, because F is the derivative of the potential. So this is actually R naught. And this is just R naught over the cubic, the sixth root of two, okay? 
So that is when the force vanishes and this is where, I'm sorry, that's where the potential vanishes and this is where the potential is at minimum. That is where the force cancels in this case. So the plot was a little bit not correct in a sense that this force in here actually needed to pass by where this function reaches its minimum, but E itself also reaches a minimum, okay? Before the force vanishes. When the two molecules are far apart, can you borrow two, three minutes from your time, guys, hopefully to finish these points? When the two molecules are far apart, basically the force is zero. That's what this is saying. And the, uh, the potential energy is zero. So there's you no know, interaction <coughs> between far away uh, molecules, but when they get cl close from one another, this is their interaction between them. Okay, which of these values represent the equilibrium separation between the molecules? Obviously it's going to be R naught, okay? This is their separation, okay? Find the value of R1 and R2 in terms of R0. Uh, find the ratio of R1 over R2. The ratio of R1 over R2 is simply going to be just one over square root of two. The sixth root of two, I'm sorry. So R0 R, uh, R or R2 over R1. Remember R2 is is uh, R0 divided by R1, which is R0, divided by the sixth root of two. And this simply becomes the sixth root of two, how far this point is from the other one. Just this much, okay? The ratio of the two, okay? How much work must be done to pull them apart so they are at infinite, so they're not interacting whatsoever. So in this case, and I'm going to answer the question, which is really not stated there, but hopefully you guys uh, can understand it, appreciate, can appreciate it, is, okay, this is the potential energy. So if you're, uh, this force derives from a potential, so if I multiply FDR and integrate, it's just going to be the work in this case. So the work FDR is just delta U, DU. So if we're gonna integrate from zero to infinity or from R naught to infinity, it's going to give me the, 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 the work needed to separate them. So the work needed to separate them is just going to be du integrated from uh, uh, so it's going to be fdr and this is minus du okay from r naught to infinity so in this case is going to be just u minus u at infinity minus u at r naught this is coming from physics for A, by the way, the force times displacement. And uh, this is actually the definition of the gradient. And the integration of du is just u itself, except I have to plug in the, ba the, ba the values at infinity. The values at infinity are zero, because if I plug in r infinity, this is zero, minus zero. So this value is zero. And this value is u of r naught, is the value of the function u in here when I plug uh, r equal to r naught. So it's gonna be one minus two, which is just minus one. So it's gonna be minus u naught. So this value, u of r naught, if you plug in the value for it, it's u naught times uh, r naught over r, which is just one, minus two times r uh, to the power seven or 13, 12, I'm sorry, which is still one, times uh, two times r naught over r naught, which is going to be one to the power six, which is just two. So this is just minus u naught. So I have in here, which is equal to minus u naught, minus minus u naught is positive u naught. So how much work in order for you to separate these molecules is exactly u naught itself, okay? And this is the energy it takes for you to separate them. Is there enough temperature to raise this, to raise it so that they can move apart? This is basically the bottom line. So if you're concerned about separation of molecules and how the temperature agitation will do that, this is a typical problem for that. So this is problem 67. I know I did it in a rush. Hopefully you guys understood it. If not, please let me know. We'll discuss it on Wednesday. We still have two more problems and then we can tackle chapter 19 as promised. Okay, let me stop sharing that screen. Don't forget guys, we have a meeting this afternoon for the thermal expansion for the lab. And then we'll meet on Wednesday where we do chapter 19. And also we don't have class, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. So I'm hoping to do a lot of things this coming Wednesday so that we can uh, do stuff also on Monday since we don't have class on uh, the 31st, that's a holiday, okay? I know I went over time, sorry about that. Four minutes over, five minutes now over time. So I'm gonna stop the recording.